Let's talk about 10 mechanics in Final Fantasy XIV that are either not explained at all or not explained super well. Let me explain them for you. And remember, if you have a tip of your own or know about a peculiar mechanic, be sure to tell me about it in the comments. Now, onto the list. Number 1. Snapshotting. When a damage over time or healing over time, dot or hot for short, is applied to a target, the buff or debuff actually takes a snapshot of the giver and receiver's status at the moment of casting. This means that when you apply a dot to an enemy, the game considers your damage buffs and debuffs and the enemy's defensive buffs and debuffs and calculates the damage per tick then and only then and deals damage based on this for the entire duration of the dot. This actually also applies for more vague quote-unquote heal over time effects like excocutation, which technically only ticks once. As you can see in this demonstration, using protraction increases the healing of excocutation by 10% if it is used before excocutation is applied. But in this other demonstration, excocutation does not receive the 10% bonus even if protraction is active when excocutation activates. The most common example to demonstrate snapshotting with is PvP. If you apply a dot to someone and then they use guard, reducing all damage by 90%, they continue to take full damage from the dot straight through the guard. On the other hand, if the target is currently guarding when you apply the dot, then the dot will still do terribly poor damage after guard ends. The way snapshotting presents itself in PvE content is in two ways. First, that any job that applies dots, especially ones with significant personal damage boosting buffs, can sometimes derive a damage gain from reapplying their dots early during buffs to snapshot the boost. Several jobs can do this, but only Bard actually has it feature as a real issue since most other dot based jobs have their dots naturally aligned with raid buffs anyway. The second way is when enemies apply dots to you. For example, Savage Raid Bosses with a Tank Buster that, as a side effect, applies a nasty dot to you. The dot snapshots the damage reduction you have at the moment of application, so using more defensive cooldowns for the initial hit, which may not be lethal anyway, helps reduce the damage of the very lethal dot that follows after. And for the extra curious, invulnerability does not count as damage reduction. It simply sets damage to zero for its duration. Which means that a nasty dot still snapshots its full damage through the invulnerability. It is just nulled while your invulnerability holds. Number 2. Building on the snapshotting subject, how do dots and hots actually tick? All damage or healing over time effects do their effects, commonly called a tick, every 3 seconds with no exceptions. Not a single one. The exceptions you might think of include Machinist's Flamethrower, PvP Dancer's Honing Dance, or PvP Gunbreaker's Relentless Rush, but these are channeled attacks and happen to play by different rule sets. All dots and hops take every 3 seconds, and effects that suggest otherwise employ a very strange extended debuff application trick mostly seen on PvP actions. A placed damage over time zone that lasts a weird number of seconds, applies a 5 second dot to the target that hits every 3 seconds, and this debuff is reapplied every tick, which causes a 10 second damage field to effectively apply a 15 second dot piecemeal over its duration. I have previously erroneously claimed that some of these actually hit every 2 seconds, but this is the real explanation of how a 10 second dot can hit 5 times over 15 seconds. This means that whenever you see a dot or hot tooltip, you can usually calculate precisely how much damage or healing the effect does in total by dividing the duration by 3 and multiplying the potency by this new number. Number 3. Auto attacks. How exactly do they work and how much damage do they do? First, unless it is a bow, chakrams or a gun, or double daggers apparently, the auto attack damage will always scale with strength, regardless of the job. For the exceptions, they instead scale with dexterity. The only jobs this distinction actually matters for are healers and mages, as their auto attacks are entirely beholden to whatever strength they naturally have. Summoners and scholars are weirdly powerful, and black mages always hit for one. Now, how much auto attacks actually do are dictated by two other factors on top of your strengths, or dexterity attributes. These two factors are found on your job's weapons and are the auto attack and delay properties specifically. The auto attack stat scales proportional to the actual damage of the weapon and compared to different weapon types is used to indicate the relative power per auto attack. 
Delay dictates how often auto attacks are performed. At some point, these steps were normalized so all weapons for a specific job always have the same delay. If you divide the auto attack value of any level 90 weapon with its delay, you will find that the number you get is the same for all weapons of the same item level and quality. Which is to say that no job happens to be particularly blessed in terms of auto attack damage, as they are all equal and only the damage per swing is different. The actual auto attack itself performs a physical attack with a potency of approximately 90 every 3 seconds, meaning faster weapons do less per swing and slower do more. This means that, for example, warrior auto attacks do around 101 potency, and paladin auto attacks do 67 per swing. Finally, whenever you cast something, your auto attacks are delayed by the cast time minus half a second the animation lock or slide casting window, which of course means that caster jobs gain very little from auto attacks. The only jobs where all of these factors play a significant part in the job is Paladin. Holy Spirit is not worth hard casting because of lost auto attacks, especially. Scholar and Summoner, the amount of instant attacks at their disposal combined with a surprisingly high base strength stat makes their auto attacks at least slightly worthwhile, even at max level. For all other jobs, it is mostly just a background detail. Number 4. Movement actions are weird. It's not lag. Have you ever been hit by a telegraphed attack, but you were sure you were out in time? I was mid-jump, but I was literally out of the telegraph. What gives? Well, the answer is very simple. As far as the game is concerned, your character actually moves from the starting position of a movement action to the final position all at once, when you reach the destination visually. So for example, elusive jump only counts for telegraphs if your feet touch the ground again before the telegraphed attack resolves. Naturally, this mechanic gets more muddy and inconsistent if you have more latency, but the general idea is correct. If you are technically out of a telegraph when it resolves, it only counts if you finish your movement action in time. Number 5. Damage buffs. And why do we stack them? A common feature of power boosts in RPGs and MMORPGs, including Final Fantasy XIV, is that buffs will stack multiplicatively, which is a very scary mathematics word for multiply them together, A times B, and is usually compared in contrast to things that stack additively, meaning that they're added together, A plus B. The reason for this is that adding things together often requires you to know a bit more about what it is exactly that you are adding together. For example, if the two buffs are completely different aspects, this is very complicated or outright impossible, like adding the speed from ley lines and the damage buff from Embolden together additively. You just can't. But multiplying them together works, sort of, because applying the speed boost and then the damage buff technically applies the same effective performance as if they had been the same kind of thing. Speed increases the speed at which you attack, increasing your damage, and damage buffs literally increase your damage. What this means for you is that if you have two different buffs that increase your damage, for example Dragoons that use Lance Charge and Dragon Sight, both increasing your damage by 10%, using them each individually will increase your damage by 10% for a bit, but using them together will increase your damage even more. The way you calculate precisely how much damage you get is to take 110% the damage you do with Lance Charge active and multiply by 110% the damage you do with Dragon Sight active, which leads to the result 121%, which means they combine to make you do 21% more damage rather than just 20. This is further compounded by jobs typically being able to use all of their heavy hitting attacks in a short time frame, so heavily boosting your damage momentarily is always better than slightly increasing your damage all the time. With enough damage buffs in a raid team stacked together, the combined value of the buffs can sometimes get quite ridiculous. This answer also conveniently segues into… Number 6. Damage Reduction and Why Don't We Stack Them? The short and sweet answer is that when you are increasing the value of something, multiplicative stacking is typically always superior because it makes the value exponentially bigger. When you want to decrease the value of something, multiplicative stacking is usually detrimental and you'd rather have additive stacking. However, the reason why additive stacking does not work for decreasing values like this, and another reason why it isn't used, is because this would enable you to decrease the value of attacks to a negative number, which makes no sense. Besides, having all buffs and debuffs stack multiplicatively also makes the exact result more predictable when you stack things together. The 10% damage reduction from reprisal makes the enemy do 90% damage, 
and then your ramp out reduces that damage by 20%, leading to a total of 72% and not 70%. Which leads us to the reason for defensive cooldown cycling. Keeping one defensive cooldown running at a time maximizes the value of it, and if you use two at the same time, it typically reduces the value of both. The only exception is that damage reduction makes barriers and other health increases more valuable, because damage reduction inversely multiplies your effective health, which shields, healing and health increases directly interact with. In other words, the Blackest Knight gains value by being stacked with other defensive cooldowns, but, say, Sentinel does not. Extending on this subject, we have Number 7. Zero damage equals zero side effects. Sometimes. But why? Many abilities and boss mechanics that enemies will use against you do both damage and apply side effects, and often the side effects are actually only applied if they do non-zero damage in the first place. This is not a bug or an oversight, as mechanics that adhere to this rule and don't adhere to this rule vary greatly enough that it is a clear decision in every case. For example, the knockback from Ifrit's fire explosion in A Realm Reborn is completely blocked if you take zero damage from it. Another example is in the Endwalker optional dungeon Smileton, where the big cheese will put down proximity mines that explode if you get too close, or when the boss chooses to detonate them. If activated, the mines will explode in a slightly larger area than their proximity area, dealing damage to everyone in range, giving them a vulnerability stack and causing paralysis on the target. But only if it actually deals damage to them. In the Ifrit example, this allows scholars and, nowadays, sages to prevent this mechanic by applying shields in anticipation of it, which was a common thing with the Realm Reborn fights. Acting in anticipation of mechanics. In the Smileton example, it allows the tank to use either flat-out invulnerability or a combination of barriers and damage reduction to nullify the damage of a mine and then eat it intentionally to give more space to the party. Now, the important thing is which mechanics are blocked by doing zero damage and which aren't very heavily, so the best way to know for sure is to test each one. Knowing which is which is also very helpful if you have just been raised, since the 5 second complete invulnerability only protects you from effects that need to do damage to apply to you. I elaborate more about this and more in this other video which you can watch after this one. Number 8. Dying through invulnerabilities. If you have played Final Fantasy XIV for a decent amount of time, you have almost certainly experienced this one in one of two ways. Using an invulnerability like Hallowed Ground, seeing it go on cooldown, you even get the buff, you might even see attacks strike you for zero sometimes, and then you die anyway. The other side is healing someone for a life-saving amount of HP, like Benediction. You see action go on cooldown, you see the healing be applied to the target, and then they die anyway. What gives? The simplest answer to this one is uh, spaghetti code and server jack. Basically, even if you have casted your invulnerability, or healing, and it looks like it came out on time, whoever applied the killing blow to you or your target already dealt the killing blow as far as the game is concerned. You just don't know it yet. This is very similar to the attacks that hit you even if you technically aren't in the telegraph anymore, but according to the server, you are in it. The thing is that this mechanic is mostly consistent, so learning to play around it is the best you can do. Don't wait until you are one hit away from death to use your invulnerability. Be a little bit more ahead on this. There is one exception to this rule regarding invulnerabilities though, and that is that some boss mechanics ignore them entirely. This is why Hallowed Ground doesn't say impervious to all attacks, but simply most attacks. The most common exceptions are death to enrage mechanics or death to a debuff that outright kills you without dealing damage to you. Number 9. Diminishing returns. What are those? Whenever a debuff is applied to an enemy that impedes them in some way, whether it is a stun, a freeze, a slow or a sleep effect, diminishing returns will rear its head. White mages are likely the most well acquainted with the mechanic. The way it works is that when you apply, say, a stun to an enemy, the first application will have its full duration applied. But if you then apply another stun to the enemy within a short time, it will only last half the duration. And if you were to do it a third time, only a fourth of the duration. After the third application, any more applications after that will simply do nothing. This is diminishing returns. The only thing missing to answer is, when does it reset? 
And this is very easy to answer. Precisely one minute after the most recent successful application of the debuff. This means that if you cast Holy once, then the targets will be stunned for 4 seconds, and then 56 seconds later, if you cast Holy again, they will all be stunned for another 4 seconds. Overall, this isn't super helpful, since most of the time, enemies you can stun with Holy would be dead by then. Hopefully. However, if you ever need to use actual crowd control, like repose or sleep, it is extremely helpful to know that the initial 30 second application actually lasts half of the diminishing returns timer. So not reapplying it with diminishing returns can allow you to keep an enemy out of the battle for 50% of the fight. Number 10. Positionals? Precisely. Several actions in Final Fantasy XIV do extra damage when performed either from the rear or the flank of an enemy. Most players have a general understanding of where that is, but it is actually a very wide area in both cases. Take any targeting reticle with an open backside, and it will have four equally large sides. The front, the two flanks, and the rear. The rear is the entirety of the open backside, so as long as your character aligns with that angle of the enemy compared to the exact center of the mob, then it counts as the rear. The two flanks then, of course, refer to the two 90 degree angles on either side of the enemy. These are a bit more difficult to determine precisely, but as long as you lean towards the arrows on the side of the enemy, you should be good. This also means that any job that has both rear and flank targeting attacks, all jobs that have any basically, most effectively should position themselves around the area where the targeting reticle switches between rear and flank, so that you can switch in an instant whenever it is necessary. Targeting reticles with a closed back don't have any specific requirements for positionals, and you will always succeed positional requirements when attacking these. Imagine a permanent true north effect. These are most commonly seen in soloable content like deep dungeons, variant and criterion dungeons, and with bosses that don't allow you to reach their back at all. You know, the common larger than the arena type bosses. You can't actually see that their backside isn't open though, so you'll just have to take my word for it. Now, that is all for this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to support me and my channel, you can make sure to let the YouTube algorithm know by liking the video, leaving a comment, subscribing and hitting the bell to get notified when next I post a video. And if you want to give even more support than that, you can also become a member of the channel like these wonderful people here. Fun fact, back in the day, side effects of actions with positional requirements actually were only applied if you performed the positional correctly. A particularly brutal example of this included Ninja's Trick Attack, which used to add a debuff that made everyone do more damage to the target. Imagine losing that due to a positional mess up. I don't have a video about that specific subject, but I do have videos about the history of some of the jobs in Final Fantasy XIV. And you can watch one about monks, known for their huge amount of positionals, right here.